Very welcome to uh, the Irish Bioenergy Association webinar this morning. Uh, my name is Sean Finan and I'm the CEO of the Irish Bioenergy Association. I hope you're all keeping well in spite of the challenges we face regarding COVID-19. Uh, this morning uh, we're joined by uh, members and non-members of the association. Just a brief introduction uh, on the Bi Irish Bioenergy Association. Um, we are the representative body um, on the island of Ireland for the uh, bioenergy sector. So we represent um, the wood fuel, biomass, biogas, biofuels and energy crop sector. Uh, we administer the WFQA, uh, which is the Wood Fuel Quality Assurance Scheme. And the Wood Fuel Quality Assurance Scheme certifies suppliers of wood chip, wood pellet, firewood, wood briquettes. All fuels certified for compliance with ISO 17225. And further information on the WFQA is available through www.wfqa.org. This morning, we're delighted to present to you uh, the first webinar in what will be a series of webinars, which we hope to roll out fortnightly. And the title of this morning's webinar is Using the Right Fuel the Right Way in the Right Appliance. Uh, this morning, I'm joined by uh, Noel Gavigan, who is the Technical Executive at the Irish Bioenergy Association, and Eugene Hendrick, who is the Chairperson of the uh, Wood Fuel Quality Assurance um, Scheme uh, Steering Committee. Uh, Noel and Eugene will both present to you this morning. Uh, this morning's uh, presentation or webinar has also been made possible by the work of Teresa O'Brien, who is our Communications uh, Manager within the Irish Bioenergy Association. And I'd like to thank Teresa for all her work in getting this webinar series uh, set up. Um, <clears throat> So just a couple of um, housekeeping rules. So if you would like to, we will have about a half an hour of a presentation uh, and then we will conclude with the questions and answer session. And to facilitate the questions and answer session, I would ask you to please uh, post your Q&A in the Q&A tab, which is in the bottom of the, of the screen. Um, we will see the questions coming forward and we will endeavor to answer um, as many of the questions as possible. So without further ado, um, I'd like to hand over to Noel Gavigan and to Eugene, will also come in uh, during the presentation uh, to present to you this morning. So over to you, Noel. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, uh, first of all, again, thanks everyone else for joining us this morning. Um, we've good numbers coming in there, so it's obviously an area of uh, significant interest. Uh, to, to this morning, we're going to concentrate mainly on looking at domestic renewable fuel. We will talk a little bit about the, the industrial scale, um, but that's more for further presentations later on in the series. So really we're looking at the options from a bioenergy point of view for, for anyone looking at a domestic uh, point of view, and that can be broken down into several areas. And I suppose uh, really we're looking at the fuel types that can be used and the appliances that can be used. Like that. Predominantly when we're looking at heating a home, we're looking at the, the point source, <clears throat> heating, which is stoves, which have been very popular over the last um, 10 years. There's a lot of installations have, have taken place. And there's also obviously central heating systems, which are a little bit more rare, uh, particularly in urban areas that tend to be more of a thing for um, rural areas and larger houses. But um, it, definitely the point source heating, the stoves is something that, that applies to all. The two fuels we'll be looking at today is predominantly firewood and wood pellets. I'll also discuss uh, wood chip uh, for industrial use later on, um, but predominantly we're looking at, at firewood and wood pellets. Um, I suppose the first part of this is to look at uh, choosing the right appliance and anyone looking at this from a domestic point of view, there's always these discussions to have and to try and figure out what is the best option for them. And there's no one answer for everyone, really it depends on what a person is looking for. And um, I suppose really we're looking to give them some good advice in terms of what, what should be considered in those uh, discussions and um, what options are out there. The first one really is looking at a uh, pellet uh, versus firewood stove and that is a significant um, decision to make as to whether you would go with, a, with what is, we see a lot of pellet stoves out there now, they're very reliable, very robust, um, very long proven track record and there's ample fuel supply and we, we've uh, manufacturers of, of fuel here in, in Ireland. So generally with pellets, they're seen as a more convenient fuel. Uh, you tend to buy them in 10 or 15 kilo bags. And uh, the 
tend to produce uh, less air emissions in terms of particulates. Um, and they would tend to be a little bit more expensive though. Um, we would also advise obviously for, for both that are installed by a correctly um, trained um, person who know, knows how to, how to install them correctly for your own safety and obviously for the integrity of the building. We, we've had occasions with, with uh, multi-fuel stoves um, over the last number of years where people have not installed them correctly and, and it has um, resulted in near tragedies. So we would advise extreme caution when you're dealing with these appliances and installations. So, um, you know, in, in the installation point, just that they're properly designed into, into the building. Now, uh, as I was saying, the, the pellets, really you're looking at the convenience of where people tend to choose that. Firewood is a little bit more work, um, but um, generally with wood fuel stoves, um, that convenience is taken down quite a lot. Pellets, you can, you can automatically um, control them. Uh, often there's a, a remote with them, there's a timers, there is um, text control, so you can turn it on from your phone. So it does offer a lot, a lot more convenience from that point of view. Um, a firewood is generally a che much cheaper stove, um, basically because there's not as much uh, hardware involved. And then we're also the next thing we look at is sizing. Um, I suppose the only piece of caution we'd really put there is too big is an inefficient thing. You know, you really need to look at what size the room is. And in fairness, a lot of the sellers will will give good advice on that. Um, and it really depends on, on where you're where you're putting this and um, how many rooms is heating. Open plan obviously can hold larger devices, but um, for a single room, you're looking at smaller uh, devices appliances. Um, the appliance type. Uh, purposely, we've, we've struck out fireplaces there. At this point in time, fireplaces are not really on the agenda. Um, generally, if a decision has been made is to take out a fireplace. So you're looking at uh, stoves, which is a pellet stove or a firewood stove, or um, the higher end of the market would be the eco-designed stoves, which are much higher in efficiency and um, produce far less emissions um, in terms of, of, of particulate uh, smoke. So that's really, and they would be more expensive, but it's really where the market is moving. Um, I've just have thrown in a, a myriad of different devices there you can use for firewood. And um, you can obviously see two fairly traditional type stoves here. Um, except on these, they're both wood fuel stoves rather than multi fuel stoves. And I'll explain that a little bit, a little bit further on. Um, in Ireland, we'll be very familiar with the, with the range cooker. Um, this is a, a wood fired range cooker rather than multi fuel. And they would tend to be quite efficient and used for, for home heating. The, on the top corner here, you can see which is essentially a log um, central heating system, or the, 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 the part of it, which is a, a log boiler. Um, as you can see, this is generally something uh, you're going to install in a, an outside building, and it will heat, heat a buffer store. There's a certain level of buffer storage in that, and it will be used for um, heating your, your rads throughout uh, the, the home. So you would tend to see, then, where we would see a lot of those is in rural areas, and in particular people that would own their own piece of forestry um, or have their own access to timber. But in general, we see quite a few homeowners going for, for that type of appliance. And it offers a very low carbon um, opportunity for, for home, the homeowner to put in something that, that's low in greenhouse gas emissions that they can use. And then the last one there is just, a, again, you can see all sorts of styles and standards of, of stoves out there. Um, difference in that I'll go into later on but um, it's just to give you an idea there's a whole range of ideas and obviously the pizza oven which is a uh, which we, we'll see as we're moving more towards our barbecue season and um, they're quite popular uh, in, in the last while. The, um, one of the key things that we are promoting is and really um, trying to advise is to selecting the right fuel and uh, the biggest issue we've seen over the last number of years is people not using the correct fuel. Firewood um, we've seen it for sale practically straight off the tree. And that is not um, an efficient fuel. Um, the standards are out there. We do certify under the Wood Fuel Quality Assurance Scheme um, suppliers of firewood. Um, but it is, it is imperative that the supply of firewood is carried out in a manner that allows correct drying. Now that's just one of our suppliers that we certified where they have a, sorry, extensive um, appliance or infrastructure uh, to dry firewood and to provide that dry then to the consumer. What we're looking at predominantly is firewood must be below 25% moisture content. Now we are approaching the Department of Environment. We've, we've officially asked them to put in regulation to limit the sale of firewood above 25% for air emission reasons and for uh, consumer protection reasons. Um, but we are looking ultimately to move that to under 20%, which, is, which will reduce emissions even further. 
and again as, a, as benefits for increased efficiency. Um, we are strongly advising that you buy firewood off a certified supplier, um, someone that the, the quality is certified, the sustainability of the supply is certified and the information that you're getting is, is clarified as well. Um, the other advice we look at then is in stove, the maintenance uh, of the stove. When you're using correctly um, dry timber, you're not going to have the same, you're not going to have corrosion with inside your, your appliance. So just be careful of that. Um, that wet fuels do tend to be much harder in your appliances and you tend not to get the same light out of them. In terms of air pollutants, which we'll go into a little bit further, Eugene will we'll discuss that later on. Um, in terms of the higher the moisture content, you get a dramatic increase in emissions um, of particulate matter, which is uh, we're all quite familiar with it with the issue that with particulate matter and our, our general air quality in urban areas. So it is something to watch out for and keeping the moisture content low and also the appliances if you use huge impact on how that um, will be mitigated. Go on the next one there. The first one really I want to look at is moisture content. Um, it's the biggest single factor in all wood fuels, whether you're looking at industrial scale or domestic scale. The moisture content has a huge impact on how the fuel operates and um, in terms of the efficiency and in terms of the emissions. Now, I'll just give an example here on the left hand side of two, um, two scenarios. One is a, a piece of firewood. And obviously in the photographs, it's the same piece of firewood, but it just gives you an idea of, of what it can be dried down to. Initially, it had a 40% moisture content um, le level in it. Now, that would be fairly um, in line with something coming relatively fresh off a tree. Probably uh, it's, it's been stored for a short while. Um, there's over half a litre of water in that. As you can see, it's a considerable amount of water that you're expecting. That piece of timber has to dry off all that water before it can, it can combust. So it has a dramatic impact in the energy content. It has a dramatic impact on the, the emissions that are going to be produced. Um, and look, effectively, you, most of the energy of that piece of timber is going to be used first off in boiling off that water before it's going to heat the home. The second example is down to 17%. Um, it's where that piece was, was dried down. And effectively in that, you've reduced the water content down to under 0.2 litre of water. Um, as you can see, it, it's far less. And interestingly enough, that doesn't impact combustion um, much at all. Once you go below, below the 20% level, the moisture content, for some uh, reason, we're not going to go into the chemistry of it, but actually aids combustion and ensures that emissions are kept lower. If you, if you dry the water out completely, believe it or not, your emissions can, can actually increase. So it, it, is, it is good to actually keep a small amount of water in there. Um, it aids combustion, it aids, it aids turbulence in the combustion zone. So, but it just gives you an idea, and not many people would be aware that the amount of water that is in a wet piece of firewood and what you're asking your stove to do, um, that piece of firewood to do before um, before it even starts heating your home. Again, the reasons we've gone through a number of them already, but uh, far greater efficiency in terms of using low moisture content. The lower emissions are considerable. Eugene will go into this a little bit more in detail uh, next, but um, effectively a 30% moisture content piece of timber will produce, or in wood fuels will produce about 30 grams of um, particulates per tonne, where it'll reduce that to slightly over seven when you've got 20% moisture content um, material. The, um, as I said earlier, it better protects your appliance. That all that water going through uh, in, at high temperature or going through your stove will cause corrosion. So it is important, uh, even from a point of view of maintaining your, your stove, maintaining your flue, that the, the moisture content is kept low, and it's obviously much better value for money. So it, it does a, have a huge impact there. Um, in terms of, one, con one question that often comes up is uh, the use of kiln dried material. Is it better or is it not? A number of our suppliers use kilns. Um, to be honest with you, it's, you tend to see kiln dried material is lower in moisture content because they're actually taking, um, effect, they're, they're taking consideration of the, reducing the moisture content. But those that are well uh, set up for air drying firewood can consistently produce material um, that is identical to kiln dried at 18%. Um, it, it takes them a bit of time to do so. It takes a bit of care, but they are capable of doing so. But effectively, the moisture content um, is really the key thing here. The method by which it got there is secondary. It, look, kiln dried obviously offers the, the user 
or sorry, the supplier the option of producing material faster and um, more consistently in, in, in wet years. But um, the, the skilled operator is able to produce something similar. Um, I would, there's one note to point out there, and that is that kiln dried firewood would have a slightly, over, a slightly higher greenhouse gas emission due to the fact that you're using fuel to dry the timber. Um, but other than that, it's, it's, it's a perfect, you know, the both are, are generally equal. Um, I might just pass over to you, Jim, there, if you want to unmute there for the, second, for the next couple of slides. Um, let you take that there, Eugene. Okay, and good morning, everybody. Um, Eugene Hendrick, as you know, is my name. Um, I'm chairing the Wood Fuel Quality Assurance Scheme. I just wanted to briefly talk about the evidence of firewood moisture content impact on emissions from wood fuel. This is in the context of uh, particulate emissions that you can get from wood combustion. But just to say that if you have good wood combustion, you basically burn everything. You end up with just carbon dioxide and water from wood. Um, with you can have very small amounts of, 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 of uh, dust and so on, but they're tiny. So the objective in wood combustion is to reduce the particulate emissions to as low as possible. And that coincides very, very closely with the point that Noel was making in relation to the moisture content. So moisture content, well, it's very, it's the primary objective of moisture content being at 20% or lower is to, um, reduce, is to get better efficiency. In other words, get more energy from your wood it's also very much tied in with the, uh, the issue of uh, particulate emissions. And we have collated a lot of evidence over the last year in relation to this point from various pieces of uh, work that's been done, mainly in France and in Germany and one or two other places. Um, so there's a report done in France in 2018. It assessed residential wood combustion. Sorry, this is the Nordic countries. Uh, uh, and found that mo moist wood generally increased em emission levels by a factor of one and a half to two times. So you can see there, if you look at the graph, um, for modern stoves, the log with 16% moisture without bark or non-spit log with 28% moisture content with bark, um, you can see there's a very, very big difference in the amount of uh, emissions that you get comparing the two. So that's really a key point particularly um, as we're moving towards better air quality. We need to move to better appliances, and we, as Noel has said, but also uh, moisture content of wood is really critically important for that. Uh, on the, on the right-hand side of that uh, part, you see the old inserts, which are essentially old fireplaces. And that's why, if you see there, while the, the lower moisture content wood uh, without bark gives you well, somewhat lower emissions, they're very, very much greater than where you have um, the modern stove. And the same applies, of course, then for the higher moisture content, it's higher again. So um, the, key, the key message here is um, use a low moisture content wood, that is wood with a moisture content 25%, preferably 20% uh, or less uh, in a modern stove. And that will have a dramatic effect on emissions. Next slide, Noel, please. Um, again, this is a similar piece of work. Um, the, uh, the European Environmental Agency uh, carry out work in terms of determining the level of um, uh, particulate emissions uh, from, uh, from various appliances. And this is what's used to compile what are called national inventories. But you can see there on the left-hand side, uh, the kilograms of particulates per year uh, comparing an open fire, an old stove, an efficient stove, an eco, an eco stove, and a pellet stove. And you can see there's a huge difference uh, in the terms of uh, between an open fire and a pellet stove, for example. There's, about, there's, a, almost, a, there's almost a 30, 35 uh, fold difference in the amount of emissions. So it's really, really important that we move away from open fires towards uh, efficient wood stoves and even our, our pellet stoves. On the right hand side, we just made a comparison uh, in relation to um, the amounts of, of kilograms of carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases that are emitted from wood. And you can see there, um, if you look at even, even with the open fire, uh, it's considerably less than in the case of gas or kerosene. The reason for that is because um, wood is, a, is, is, is where, where it's sourced from sustainable forests. You, it's, uh, the, the, uh, the carbon dioxide that's emitted at combustion is taken back in by the forest, albeit over, over some time, but it does come back in. 
So that is not counted then as an emission. It's not counted as a, as a carbon dioxide emission. And you can see there is a huge difference. So there's another benefit from using wood fuels is that they're low, low carbon dioxide emissions compared to the likes of fossil fuels, for example, uh, gas and kerosene. And even if you look at heat pumps at the moment, um, heat pumps are very efficient uh, and they are a good technology, but they do, have a lot, they do have higher levels of carbon dioxide emissions compared to, um, to, uh, to wood fuels. And uh, similarly for, for various types of heat pumps, that is the case. And the varies, you can see there, there's a scale uh, of, of the different types of heat pumps. That's a reflection actually of the amount of um, renewable energy that's on the on national grid. And this is an average uh, of, the, of, the, of the, um, the national grid, the amount of carbon dioxide that's actually been emitted on average uh, if you use electricity from the national grid. So the message there is to summarize again, um, low um, emissions from, uh, from uh, efficient stoves, low emissions from, uh, from pellets, and um, le less carbon dioxide emissions when you, when you combust wood, provided it's from a sustainable source. Next slide, Noel. Okay. Thanks. I, okay. Okay, o over to you. Right. Um, thanks, Eugene. Um, I know a lot of it very, is hugely relevant to what we're doing here. The other thing to consider when people are choosing a fuel, and it's a question we would get a lot, um, and it's always up for debate, is whether um, hardwood uh, is much better than softwood and there's a huge debate there and uh, why people would have a preference for one over the other and we just said we went into the, the details of that so people can get an idea of uh, what the differences are because there's not actually a lot in particular when using stoves. Um, <clears throat> on the left there we have a piece of ash and on the right we have a piece of Norway spruce. Now those two pieces we picked out because they're identical in weight, they're both uh, 0.75 a kilogram they're identical in moisture content at 20%, and they both would have very similar energy contents. Um, and this is what uh, sometimes surprises people that both of those would have, um, it works out a little over 11 megajoules of energy in, in each of those blocks. Now, as it turns out, your softwood would tend to have slightly more energy per kilogram than your hardwood because it tends to have more oils, more volatiles in it. So it's probably closer to 11.6. Um, rather than 11.2, which you can see there for, for, the, for the hardwood. So the only difference really is that the hardwood is a, it's a much more dense product and more compact. As you can see, it's a, it, just in terms of the physical size of both pieces of firewood, you can see it's a more compact piece. Um, so that does have, um, for, in terms of obviously filling up a stove, it does have, have an impact there. And, um, but other than that, they're generally identical in terms of energy. The other thing we would say is if you are uh, stuck in using a, an open fire, it tends to be hardwood tends to work out better because there's less volatiles in it, um, it, it tends to have a little more controlled um, in an open fire situation. But in a stove, both tend to be identical and you will find that the hardwood, it does sell it at a premium price. Um, so it depends on what you're looking at, at a cost efficiency or um, what, what, what different reasons you have. Well, that's just a comparison so you can see what the difference is in terms of a domestic setting, uh, what, what differences are there. And um, we would see both as, as equal products in terms of uh, use in a stove. Um, I just want to go through, and it's, it's something that people uh, are not overly familiar with, is how the correct operation of a stove. And it's actually very important to understand how different fuels operate. Um, and how stoves are set up because we're, we're all familiar with them and, and we're used to lighting them and uh, putting fuel into them. But there's different controls and different methods that can make a difference. Um, first off, um, I just want to show you is this is obviously a sample filled up with we're using wood fuel. And we're all familiar with two vents in our stoves at the, the, the top. Um, the top one tend people into a view as something for clearing the glass and then using the bottom one then for uh, fueling the fire. They have two particular terms. The air coming in from the bottom is called primary air, and it's very important to know the difference. Um, you would tend to use primary air a lot, um, and it's very important when you're burning something like foss any fossil fuels, like coal or peat. Um, you tend to need a lot, of, a lot of primary air because there's a much higher level of carbon in those fuels. Um, but when you're using wood fuels, it's different. So generally, the traditional method is you light the, light the fire at the bottom, um, pile your fuel in on top and um, it'll go on up the chimney. 
you may add in secondary air, as I said, uh, it's often an afterthought by people. That mixes up in the combustion zone and uh, will create so, some more additional uh, combustion and also help keep glass clean. But the secondary air is far more important than that. And we just want to explain that um, over this process because it, it is a critical thing. It, when you're burning timber, secondary air is the key thing. Um, so in terms of using timber only in a multi-fuel stove, first of all, we would advise that you use certified firewood and that it must be below 25%. Um, and again, we're, we're looking to move that to under 20, but when you're under 25, you're, you're, in the, you're starting to enter the sweet, sweet spot. Um, when you're lighting it, strong advice is actually not to light it at the bottom. Um, unusually enough, when, when firewood is dry enough, you light it at the top. Set up your, your kindling at the top and the fire will burn down through um, your stock of timber. Now, what that does is it allows um, the timber to burn in a much more controlled fashion and it reduces the emissions that light up considerably. Normally, if you're setting the fire at the bottom, it's burning its way up through and it'll produce huge amounts of smoke, which all obviously go up the chimney and are emitted into the local area. Whereas lighting it on top, it burns down and it, it, it controls it. It, it, it tends to combust much better. Um, so it, it's one of the one piece. We would see a lot of Europeans doing this. The Europeans uh, tends to be the standard way of doing it. Here in Ireland, we tend to be lighting at the bottom and that's speed or because of our experience in using um, fossil fuels. Um, the other thing is, sorry, is the importance of secondary, sorry, I'm not going backwards there. Um, the importance of secondary air. Um, secondary air is that, that air on the top. When you're burning wood fuels, secondary air is the critical thing to use because you have a lot more gases, a lot more volatile material in timber and that's where uh, 80 to 90 percent of the energy comes from and um, the, the air mixes with the gases that comes off and combusts in that zone you get a lot more flame out of, out of timber as a, as a result but you should use secondary air as, as, as a, the main thing and you should actually shut off your primary air and um, you should not be using primary air is good for lighting a fire to start but if you're using wood fuel you should not be letting air in underneath in, in under general context it'll get enough coming in Second down to the bottom to the secondary air, but you should shut off that completely, um, and you should open up all all of your air through the, the secondary air portals, which you'll normally see at the top of the stove. Um, and that does two things. It first of all uh, will lower the emissions coming off it, but secondly, it increases the the um, the efficiency of the stove uh, considerably because normally if you're putting in primary air, it causes too much heat on the grate, causes too much heat in the fuel. And you end up producing a lot of uh, uh, flammable gases and uh, unburned particles that go up the chimney and you're basically losing fuel up the chimney by um, putting in primary air so it, it's very important to shut off primary air and just use secondary air when burning timber the other thing we would advise is not using uh, as we're moving forward in this multi-fuel stoves are they're a bit of a jack of all trades uh, definitely master of none really and truly where we people should be moving towards is using wood only stoves um, or better still the high-end eco-design stoves. They reduce the emissions uh, considerably, much higher in efficiency um, and th their design is quite different. Believe it or not in, in those stoves you tend to see very very little um, facility for primary air because it's just not needed. You might see a couple of six mil holes drilled in the bottom to allow a small bit of air into the bottom um, and you will tend to see their design that you let the ash build up um, which, believe it or not, uh, helps to increase efficiency and you tend to just take out ashes sporadically. It's amazing when you when you burn timber in a, a, a properly designed stove, the amount of ashes reduces by, I'd say, about 80% um, because you're completely combusting the fuel that you're putting in. You'll also notice that the ashes are white rather than grey because the grey is basically unburnt carbon. So it, it's far more efficient when you're using a, a wood fuel only stove, an eco design stove, and you're eliminating the use of primary air. Primary air is really just something for fossil fuels. Um, we would obviously strongly advise using certified fuel. Uh, I just have to put the mark in there that we use for uh, the wood fuel quality assurance scheme. All our certified suppliers, uh, they must supply it under 25%. They're all well trained in that at this point in time. They've all got plenty of experience on it. And we're taking on new people within the scheme on a regular basis. Um, and under most of them, some come with, with uh, plenty of knowledge, others we, we assist them in, in getting well down the long learning curve on it. 
Now, the other thing we would advise, obviously, is regular maintenance of both the appliance and the flue, the chimney, in the chimney. Um, follow the manufacturer's guidelines in terms of the, of the stove, but keeping them maintained uh, correctly is, is very important, both in terms of efficiency and in terms of maintaining the appliance and in, in terms of safety, and um, particularly in terms of safety. So we would just strongly advise that always make sure that you're maintaining it correctly and that you're keeping the uh, clear. Um, sorry. Now, Eugene, do you want to come in back in that slide here on the different uh, types of appliances? Again, it's a similar slide to before. Yeah, again, this is just to repeat the point, I suppose, but um, if you compare the different, uh, the combustion appliances uh, in reducing particulate emissions per unit of energy use, uh, this is from a project called Air Use. So you see there the open fireplace, uh, then we have the wood stove, the eco eco labeled wood stove. Uh, there's two different types there. A pellet stove, you can see there's very 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 low levels of emissions, and um, pellet boilers the same, and pellet another pellet boiler different different. Uh, in this project, they looked at a number of different appliances, uh, different pellet stoves. But again, it's just to re-emphasize the message that um, the stove is really really important in terms of the level of emissions. Thanks, Noel. Okay, cheers, Eugene. Now. Uh, the, the next thing I want to look at is uh, wood pellet stoves and appliances. Um, again, there's a huge range of these on the marketplace. Um, what I've put in here is a few different examples. We're, we're all quite familiar with the standalone stove. Um, you can fill the be hopper at the back that you fill with fuel, and they tend to operate quite automatically. Um, I think it's generally weekly maintenance and those and taking out ashes. Again, you'll find the level of ashes very small. Um, very similar one on the, up in the upper right hand corner which is again it's a it's a room heating stove and um, that, that's a slightly higher capacity uh, an interesting one we came across uh, in Italy is this version where it heats ducted air so you can duct the hot air around the, the home and um, we're seeing a lot more different types of designs coming out in terms of like the Italians believe it or not use far more wood fuel than, than you'd expect um, we're, we have a market here of about half a million tons in of firewood. The Italians, uh, both in terms of pellet and firewood, uh, they're using in, in, up in the order of, I think it's over 20 million tons compared to our half a million. So um, you tend to find that they have a lot of good technology. And uh, we've, we've some very good manufacturers here, in fairness, we just don't have as many. And the, the market is, we're slowly developing here. Uh, the Italian consumer is a bit more aware of what's, what's required. Um, so it, it just means that our manufacturers have to move a little bit slower. Um, last one then is a domestic uh, central heating system uh, running off pellets. Again, relatively compact unit, uh, but that's not just include the fuel store. And you tend to see again, not so much in urban areas because space is smaller or houses are smaller, um, but ideal for for um, where you where you have large um, demand of heat, um, and that that's obviously can be used for small commercial as well. Uh, you tend to see wood pellets now. Funnily enough, the bulk supply is very strong in Ireland, uh, mainly for industrial and commercial premises and, and some houses. But the, the bag product, um, that's some of our certified for the WFQA, the bag product is now um, becoming a very much, uh, very strong um, side of the market in term, because that's what people are using for their stoves, for this type of stove and this type of stove. So we're seeing sales of that going up uh, considerably over the last number of years, um, both in Ireland and, and across Europe. Um, sorry, just a small bit of advice in applying, when looking at buying wood, wood uh, pellet stoves, buy only C certified appliances. We can't stress that enough, and preferably you could design, but ensure that it's, it's uh, properly uh, certified. Uh, have it installed by somebody who's trained to install it. Um, you know, these things are, you know, they, they need to have the, 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 the proper um, flu installed, they need to have, be proper, properly put in, that is not going to cause a problem. And they can cause problems um, and very serious problems if they're not installed correctly. So uh, we cannot stress it enough, ensure that it's, 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 the installation is done by somebody who's trained and knows what they're doing. Um, you must have proper ventilated storage for wood pellets. Uh, over time, they will get damp um, if, if they're not properly uh, stored. Um, so it needs to be in a dry location. Um, but it also needs, needs to be properly ventilated. Wood pellets need to breathe, so ensure that the area is ventilated. You'll see the bags are all perforated to allow for, for that. Um, 
they don't need a lot of air but they just need a lot of ventilation but it's a small amount um, follow the maintenance procedures in any appliance you buy um, it, it'll, it'll in, in ensure a long life for it and also ensure that it operates correctly and only fuel with certified fuels um, you ha you know, if you're putting that investment into, into an appliance make sure you're going to um, buy fuel that is go going to look after it as well so again that certification can come through the WFQA or EN plus which is a European stroke worldwide uh, accepted standard which we use on the WFQA so look out for either of those labels um, when, you're, when you're buying product um, that's really on the domestic side of it. Um, we'll come back to that in questions. I just want to quick, uh, look at, at the industrial scale, um, just to, but we'll be discussing this later on in the series. Predominantly on industrial scale, you're looking at wood chip or wood pellet. They are, are unique in the fact that they're offering the only solution um, for anyone looking for high grade heat. So if you're looking for steam, if you're looking for high temperatures, if you're looking for you know 80% or 80 degrees plus, Really and truly, um, the only renewable option for that, uh, as, in particular on the larger scale, is using a wood fuel. So, um, you know, that, that is, the only, is the option there available, or the only option available. In per, steam, there is no other option where you're going to start using electricity. So it's a, it's, it's a very effective, we don't, we don't have a geothermal here in Ireland. So um, or the large scale geothermal can do steam. We don't have that, the natural resources for that. So, um, it has got the lowest carbon footprint uh, heating solution out there uh, for, for that type of heating. Um, the only thing that can lower wood fuel actually is ambient heating, so your solar gains and insulation. So really and truly, it, it's, um, the, the carbon um, credentials here are very high for, for, for wood fuels. Um, the lower unit cost in terms of when you're using a wood chip and wood pellet, uh, depending on, on the scenario you're putting in, but there's also a support scheme available there for called the SSRH uh, through SCAI. Uh, it's a support scheme for renewable heat. It's, it gives a subsidy for 15 years. It is uh, adequately priced to ensure that, um, that, that anyone that's looking to do this, whether they're in, in different sectors, um, that it would support them in, in, in that sort of installation. Um, look, we'll look at that later on in the series. Um, but again, those industrial fuel types that uh, we would look at, there's some differences why would you, you would choose wood pellet or wood chip. Uh, in terms of wood pellet, it, it tends to be a little more convenient. Uh, it's a smaller size, uh, a site footprint. So if you're limited in space, um, often wood pellets will fit in a bit more convenient than wood chip. Um, you tend to see wood pellets uh, being used for smaller scale from 20 kilowatt um, up to a megawatt and above one megawatt if it needs to be. Uh, but predominantly what, what uh, the peop reason people will choose away from wood pellets, it's got a higher fuel price than chip. So when you start getting into higher scale, you tend to look at wood chip. Um, wood chip has got the lowest life cycle greenhouse gas emissions that there is. Um, they're very simple to produce and uh, fit into the normal forestry management uh, program. So uh, they're very valuable for that. Scale tends to be from 150 kilowatt up to 10 megawatt plus. Uh, there's 50 megawatt out there. Um, you know, but it, it's, you tend to see the scale start at 150 kilowatt. Uh, Some will say lower, like single 100. So it is, is available. It tends to be a lower fuel cost as well. Um, I know there's, what is important there is the quality of that fuel. And you will see different qualities of fuel being used for a, a 150 kilowatt than you will for one megawatt. So just that's something to be watched out for when you're looking at that. Again, if anyone's looking for advice on that, ourselves or our members would be more than happy to give it. Um, so suitable industries, really you're looking at the food service. Um, so hotels, primary agriculture, so poultry farms, pig farms, horticulture, uh, in the industrial scale, you tend to see a lot of pharmaceutical interest in this because uh, they need high grade heat, they need steam. Uh, we have one very good example in the country so far, um, Estellas Pharmaceutical, who have uh, uh, produced all the heat on site from uh, wood chip. Um, you can see this uh, biomass being used in the polymer industry, for, again, for steam production and for processing and for food, food processing. So there's plenty of industries, any industry out there that needs high grade heat, uh, biomass is, is suitable for it. And um, you know, it's really a case of anyone that's interested in that can come and contact us and we're more than happy to, to, to offer advice on it. So that's effectively it. Um, sorry, let's have the and there just go back to the the series. Um have any questions, but then this is the series that we're looking at later on. So I'll hand it back to Shonda. Okay. <clears throat> thanks very much, Noel, and uh, thanks for your presentation and thanks also to Eugene. Um, we have a number of questions coming in, um, so I would encourage you to 
continue to submit your questions through the Q&A tab at the bottom of, the, of your screen. Uh, the first one, Noel, um, a supplier here of uh, air-dried hardwood to customers. Um, and this individual is wondering, does the firewood legally need to be qu quality compliant to a certain standard? So it I, I, as it stands, uh, yeah, no, as it stands, it doesn't. There's no legal requirement on firewood at all. It can be straight, literally cut off a tree and, and handed to a customer. Um, now we are, as you're, most people are probably aware, last year there was a lot of discussion over um, different types of fuels that, and, and the smoky coal ban, um, which is looking to be extended. Um, there is a lot of focus on this area. We are strongly advocating that there should be control on, on wood fuels, that there should be a requirement um, for firewood in particular that it's under 25%. And we are with what we have proposed to the, the Department of Environment, and this is with the full support of our members that actually came from our members and um, our suppliers who want to get control the, the market to, to be regulated. Um, we are looking for under 20%. And in, just look at the consumer there for the, the supply firewood to pizza ovens, they'll be well aware that you need to have it at low moisture uh, for those sort of appliances to work correctly. So, um, you know, in particular, it's, it's when you're dealing with it's direct contact with, with the food in order to keep smoke down and everything else, you do, re and in order for it to burn correctly, you want good dry material. Okay, no, just to follow on actually to that, um, this customer is supplying this wood for uh, pizza ovens, uh, where the pizzas obviously are being produced, does it need to be food safety compliant? Or is there any requirements around it being um, food safety compliant? Um, it's a good question. I'm not involved in food safety. Um, so I can't really answer it straight out. Only, the only thing I'm, I'm thinking of is there wouldn't want to be direct contact with, with the food unless there's a, it's got food safety compliance. But to be honest, it's not an area I have any expertise in. I'm um, sorry, I can't really answer that straight. Okay, a uh, question here, Noel, um, and maybe Eugene, you want to come in as well. Uh, the difference in hardwoods versus softwoods. Um, are resins, etc., cetera, in, in softwoods harder on appliances? Quite a technical question, yeah. and maybe one you wouldn't have an answer for, but... Yeah, no, no, that, that's... That, that's, uh, as Eugene was saying earlier, um, when it combusts correctly, everything is uh, reduced down to carbon dioxide and water vapour. Um, what I was explaining earlier, where you've got your, your secondary air, that's why it's so critical. Generally, what you find is the wood fuels, you know, both hard and, hard and soft wood, have a lot of volatile material and those resins um, that the questioner is asking about. And it's within those resins where a lot of the energy of the timber is. So uh, if you took them out, it would have very little energy left, to be honest with you. So it's getting those combusted is the important thing. Now, when you have a, a low, or sorry, a high level of moisture content in the wood, what tends to happen is your stove is operating at a much lower temperature. It doesn't combust properly, and you tend to have those resins rising up through the, the flue and getting stuck on things. Um, but when you have the proper temperatures in there, when it's the moisture content is correct, when you've got the right secondary air going in there, that could be fully combusted and it's not a problem at all. It's actually part of the fuel. Okay, Eugene, maybe a question for you there. Um, this uh, attendee is asking, is there a map available that highlights areas that are more suitable for larger sized biomass heating installations, considering proximity to fuel source, access for trucks, air quality zones, proximity to woody residue sources? So, is there any map available or maybe do you want to explain what is available in terms of the forestry resource which we have and the biomass supply uh, that's there? Okay, thanks for the question. And um, basically, um, if you go into the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine website, there's a thing called um, the Roundwood, it's a bit of a mouthful, Roundwood Forecasting Tool. But basically it enables you to find out in, for any area of the country, wherever it may be, in the Republic of Ireland, what the wood resource is. Uh, when I say wood resource, it's mainly thinnings we're talking about here, and to some extent residues. We, when, I, when I say residues, I mean when you fell a forest, there's material left in the ground, and that's what we call, class as residues, forest residues. So that's available. So you can, for example, if you wanted to set up a, a biomass heating facility 
in Mallow, for example, you can draw any radius around the town of Mallow to 50 or 60 or 70 kilometers, whatever the case may be, bearing in mind that there's a certain economic radius for wood haulage. You know, it doesn't, wood is a low value product and it doesn't, uh, you can't be hauling it too far, uh, particularly wood chip. But anyway, supposing you, you want to set up a wood uh, biomass facility in, uh, in Mallow, you can, this tool will enable you to draw a radius of, as I said, uh, whatever kilometrage you want, and it'll tell you how much wood fuel is available in that uh, zone over different years, and it breaks it down into different species. So that tool is available, as I said, on the Department of Agriculture website. If you want any more help with it, come back to us and we can maybe facilitate that a bit more. It's, it's a bit technical for this discussion, but I'll just suffice to summarize that there, it's available, you, it, it can be used and you can estimate uh, the wood resource that's available for the next 20 years within those catchment areas. Thanks, Eugene. Just a question for you and all here. Um, in terms of uh, domestic versus commercial installations, um, is there an, applic a, an applicable PM limit uh, which installations need to adhere to? So um, would you be able to maybe explain all the difference uh, yes. Also, in terms of moisture content of material for a commercial uh, installation versus a domestic installation, and the difference the technology. Sorry, just, uh, we, talk, we talk about the fuel or the appliance there, Sean. Sorry. Well, I What's think uh, is is there an applicable PM limit, which is obviously it's it's to do with the appliance. I would expect okay. if it's a particular um, matter limit. But explain the difference in commercial plus uh, versus yes. domestic there, in terms of um, the two is. The there are standards there for large scale commercial and um, there, there's standard C uh, markings for any um, appliance. Um, now, it's not as, as stringent at the moment on stoves, uh, but it is when you start looking at, at wood pellet and wood chip boilers. There, there is a require, strong requirements there. Um, there's also the eco design standard, which does cover stoves, but it's not law yet. But that is due to come into Ireland in 2022, I understand. Um, and that will bring us in line with the rest of Europe in, in having strict requirements on what, what uh, PM and the other uh, VOCs and other, I mean, you know, it, it looks at all those, sets, sets limits on all of those. Um, but there, the, the CE marking is critical in that and um, you will see any industrial installation will, will have that, uh, it will be well tested in that. But linked to that is the fuel that they use. So it, it needs to be, it, uh, an appliance will be certified based on a particular type of fuel. So if it's 25% moisture content and it's able to meet those PM limits, it has to be fueled at 25 because if you put in 35%, it might be able to burn it, but your emissions will go up. So that's where a lot of fuel certification and the SSRH and fairness scheme, that, that support scheme, uh, ensures that you have, or sets in that you must have ensured that you're, you're fueling the right appliance with the right fuel. I think there's a follow-on question here, Noel. If I may, Sorry, Eugenia. I just want to add to what Noel has said. Uh, I think eco design is a real game changer here because uh, it does specify that you have to, any stove that's going to be put on the market has to um, comply with a certain level of particulate emissions. And some of those actually brands and stoves are actually available at the moment. So um, rather than waiting until 2022, you can actually go in and buy one of those stoves, not right now. Uh, if it has the eco design label on it or it's certified as eco eco design ready so um you know it's a it's going to be a, a big change and um obviously it'll take time to uh to get into widespread use eco design stoves because stoves obviously have a lifetime uh but anyway um they are available and the eco design is applicable now to to boilers larger larger uh heating uh, water heating type appliances and that's come in since the beginning of, 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 uh, of this year, actually. So uh, they're out there and um, we would be strongly supporting the use and the, uh, even the, you know, before the, the legal date, if you like, to, to for people to consider using those types of stoves. And they're more okay. efficient as well. Okay, we'll keep going, guys. We have nine minutes left and we have quite a few questions here to get through. So the next question, maybe Noel, if you can keep the answers quite brief, it'll be good too. Um, is EN plus a certification for wood fuels for both domestic and industrial, so that's for wood pellet uh, certification. Short answer, yes, EN plus certifies a certification for, for wood pellet for all scales. Wood pellet only. 
Uh, yeah, EM plus is only for a wood pellet. Um, a question here, is there a general rule of thumb for fuel storage space for installations? I suppose that depends on the size and the design of the installation. Um, yeah, look, it, it depends on, um, if you're looking at, at an industrial scale, you tend to, look, it all depends on your traffic requirements. I mean, if you're in a location where you can only realistically get a delivery in once a week, you'd be looking at doing it like that. Certain installations, they'll do, do it out to about a month. You tend to find you're trying to scale uh, it towards the delivery size. So wood pellet, you'd be looking at five ton minimum. Uh, wood chip, you'd probably tend to be looking at 15, 20 ton minimum because um, just a, with sizes of trucks and uh, it brings the cost down considerably. So okay. it really, that's where I would say it on that. Okay, just a, another question here, Noel. Um, one on, uh, I think you might have addressed it as part of the presentation or touched on it briefly. Uh, a wood chip boiler keeps burning through its components due to high temperatures in the combustion chamber. Um, this attendee is being told that their wood chip is too dry. Um, do you want to just elaborate on that? Um, you mentioned earlier about how there needs to be a certain level of moisture within the material for it to combust properly. Yeah, that could be a factor. It depends on what too dry is, what level of moisture content is. Um, Right, it, without knowing the boiler, without like the manufacturer would probably have um, some good advice on that. But just anecdotally myself, what I would be thinking is there's probably too much primary air. Now the first thing I would look at is there is there too much primary air? Because when you've got primary air coming in, as I was discussing earlier, um, and it doesn't matter whether it's a, a domestic stove or industrial system, um, you're putting all that heat right where the fuel is because it, you have all the oxygenation, you have all the combustion happening right there on the grate. And that temperature shoots up very high. So you t by using the secondary air more so than primary air, you're also reducing that temperature on the grate itself, which uh, has other problems as well. And one of the questions that a uh, questioner could ask or could look at is have they ever had a problem with a thing called clinker, whereas you've got too high a temperature on the grate and it causes the ash to literally melt and form large lumps. And if that was the case, that would be indicative of, well, maybe there's too much primary air going in. But um, it's something that I've been talking to the manufacturer on. Okay. The question for you, you uh, sorry, for you, Eugene, um, what do you think can be done to incentivize a change from open fires to eco-design stoves? What, what would be required to incentivize that change uh, for domestic users? Well, I think, um, there's a lot of incentives about information, you know, um, if people realize that um, by using an efficient stove, you know, you're actually going to say it'll be a, obviously an upfront cost, but your efficiency, the amount of energy you get from your per unit of per ton of, of, uh, of, of firewood is far greater. So that's a big incentive. It's also that the fact that you're less, you're emitting less particulate emissions and it's better for the environment generally. Um, there's been various schemes in other countries um, to encourage what they call um, change outs of inefficient fireplaces and with, with uh, more efficient stoves. Um, that, may be, that may be something that could be considered, but we see the primary incentive as being in the long run, you'll, you'll save money by using a more efficient stove and you'll be doing, it, you'll be doing your bit for the environment in, in le less emissions, less particulate emissions. Okay, thanks, Eugene. Um... Just a question here, Noel, for you um, around the WFQA and the and the certification and inspection process, um, and particularly regarding small suppliers of domestic wood fuels. Could the process be less costly for the participant and more efficient? Or can you maybe explain to attendees what the process is involved in getting WFQA certified and how then you can work with smaller suppliers. I think this particular attendee is supplying less than 200 ton annually. So um, okay. can you, um, no, we've only a couple of minutes left, so yeah. I'd ask you to be brief because uh, well, we have two final questions then okay. to conclude the, with. The, the, the um, process is basically we do an on-site inspection. We look at three things in principally. We look at, first of all, the, the sourcing of the raw material. So that, that has to come from a sustainable source. Um, and we're doing a lot of work to actually bring that up to a European level now because it's controlled in that as well. But, and we're confident on that. So first thing is the fuel, the raw material supply has to come from a sustainably managed forest. Um, second one is 
the labeling, or sorry, the, the, the quality of the fuel itself. So moisture content testing and often size profiles and things like that. But make sure that the supplier is competent to uh, test their own fuels and to understand the requirements around that. The third thing then is information going to the consumer so that the proper label is on the bag, uh, that the proper weight or the volume is on the bag, and there's advice there for the consumer as well so that they know how to use it correctly. Now, in terms of the, the cost of the scheme, we don't spend many years trying to take down the cost. Part of the cost is we have to do independent testing, we have to do an independent audit, and that unfortunately does come into a, a couple of hundred euros when you when you take all that into account. There is a scheme in the UK where they allow people self-certify, so to speak. We're not gone on that here because um, it's open to um, abuse. Um, so we're keen to work as much as we can, but it, it is a difficult thing to do. If I don't know if that answers the question. But. Yeah, so if anyone on the webinar this morning is interested in getting involved in the WFQA or becoming certified, I would ask you to get in touch with um, Noel or the association and we can talk through the process and also talk to you about the costs associated and the inspections that are required in order for that to take place. And Noel, just a kind of a, a question here. Um, uh, this particular attendee says that they dried their timber to blow 20% moisture, but the boiler is designed for 25 to 20 to 30 percent. Uh, how can I achieve this moisture target? It sounds counterintuitive burning chip at anything other than dry. Um, and I think uh, this particular attendee is reducing their moistures to 17 and a half, as I understand. Right, okay. So the boiler is designed to work at 25 to 30%, and they're using stuff that's under 20. Um, that's probably where, if that's the same as, as person as before, that's probably where the issue is, because funnily enough, there is a design, if, if, for, so if you take out some of the larger industrial scale ones, they're designed to burn material at 50% moisture content and 45. If you put stuff in under 20, you'd actually crack it. You know, you would crack the plates in it, you would, you would destroy it. Um, because it's designed to actually dry that fuel in the first part and then um, uh, combust it. So it's actually designed to meet all the requirements, all the emission requirements and do everything else, the efficiency at that moisture content. So I think the problem there would be that it is actually going in too dry. Um, and I know it's counterintuitive when you have lovely dry material to start, uh, like you don't add water to it, but you can blend it in with, with uh, wetter material if, if you need to. Um, and as a use the Pearson square or something like that to determine the rate which you, you blend it in. But if the design, if the, if it's the design is twenty five to thirty, then that's possibly where the issue is if you if it, they're going in with under twenty percent material. Okay, and um, just because we're coming to the end of our session this morning, uh, just two final. Uh, I suppose one is a point that um, thanks, Michael, for your point. Um, and maybe Eugene, you can comment on it, and Eugene, you can address the last question as well. Um, point here made by that less particulate emissions also means better indoor air quality, uh, which would be obviously um, important with, for people, particularly those with respiratory issues. Uh, and the final question for you, um, Eugene, is about the current capacity of um, fuel biomass, wood pellets, etc. cetera, now for larger scale complexes or industrial users. Um, would you be able to just comment uh, on that um, about the potential for larger complexes and industrial uses of biomass and wood pellets and wood fuels? Yeah, and um, just on the indoor, yeah, that's absolutely true what Michael Young has said. That's a, a very important point actually as well. Um, on the, the availability of the material, uh, again, I go back to the um, to what I said earlier on about the supply side and the fact that um, there's a lot of material out there now because the forests of the, in the private sector particularly are coming into the production stage. There's a, quite a large volume of material available out there. And I would urge anybody who's thinking about, you know, an enterprise or a, or a supply chain to look into the, the supply side, uh, the, the tool that's on the department of agriculture website and um, as I said earlier on again if you want any more information come back to us and we can direct you maybe to somebody in the department who might be able to talk you through that. 
And just on your screens, you see a list of the follow on webinars. We do hope to go fortnightly. We will be issuing confirmation of the time and date, but we expect it will be two weeks' time for the next webinar. Uh, and it will delve more into some of the specifics. This morning's was just a kind of an opening introduction uh, to this whole area. I'd like also uh, remind participants, our attendees, that we will be broadening out the scope of the webinar series as well to cover some of the other bioenergy areas. Um, as we move through. I see there is a question, a final question here um, on eco design and how can we know if a stove is eco de design ready. Um, there will be a specific um, a webinar on eco design. Um, I expect that Eugene, maybe you could answer that in terms of it, it would be labeled and... Uh, the label, there's an eco design label that's um, yeah. you should look for. Yeah, so I think that concludes. Um, there are a couple of other questions which unfortunately we didn't have the time to get to uh, this morning. But as I said, uh, in the next number of webinars, we'll be going into more of the specifics uh, on some of the topics which have been discussed here this morning. Um, I'd like to conclude by thanking you all for participating. I'd like to thank Noel for, and Eugene for presenting. I'd like to again acknowledge Teresa, um, who works with the Irish Bioenergy Association for for help and assistance behind the scenes to make this possible. Um, and indeed, finally, just to thank you all um, for participating this morning. Um, our objectives as an organization are to grow and develop this sector um, and provide people with um, information on um, everything we do and, and the whole sector. So if you do have any f specific feedback or comments, please feel free to uh, revert back to us. Uh, you can access um, our website on www.erbia.org. And also, if you have any queries, you can send them to contact at erbia.org. Uh, and we will pick up on, on any other queries you have and um, follow up with you. That's about it. So thanks, everyone. Uh, we'll leave it at that. And we look forward to seeing you on the, the next occasion.